Gizzy, thank you so much for joining us. Hello. This has been a long time coming, hasn't it? <laughs> it has been a long time coming. I'm so excited. I think I want to start off slightly differently today because <laughs> I, I ask I ask all my guests to tell me an item that represents ADHD <laughs> in their life. When you told me your item over the weekend, I thought it was so relatable. Um, I wanted to start with it. And you said your item was the YouTube logo. <laughs> so could you explain what you meant by that? Okay. So when I know I'm peak ADHD, um, and, and by that I mean when I'm really hitting mania, um, I tend to find myself in bed and I can lose. And I mean literally lose. I'll sit down, well, sit down. I'll lay down in bed. I'll be like, oh, I can't really sleep. I know. I'm just going to pick up my phone. Worst idea. Mm. And I'm going to look at YouTube. And then I'll start looking. I love sharks, right? So I'll find something that I have an obsession with. Normally something that I've had an obsession with since I was a child. Mm. Um, maybe arguably not so much with some of the other stuff. <laughs> but... Um, and then I'll start looking for like nice shark videos. Before long, I'm into shark attacks, shark attacks on humans. Like I'm, and I'm suddenly looking at all of these videos and then going on weird tangents all over the place. And I'll be in bed from like quarter to 12. And suddenly I'm like, shit, it's half seven. I've got to get up <laughs> in two hours. What the fuck have I done? Yeah. Like it just goes. The whole, t the time just vanishes. And that's when I know I'm really in peak peak you know when you hit mania and a lot mm. of people don't really talk about adhd mania mm. and actually weirdly what was interesting is that when i i mean it did that big side of things became quite destructive in my life and i did go and get it checked out because i was like this is not normal and i got also re-diagnosed with uh having again all the adhds i already knew i had and then a condition called cyclothermic disorder which is associated with bipolar but it's not actually a lot of adhd people have it and it's where you get into a manic episode mm. until you fall back to sleep again so it's quite a strange one you know what's, what's a manic episode feel like that what i just, just described you, into... you, you lose time you don't know what you're doing you're you we you, you, you have a mission mm. but you completely lose the hours within it that that's what happens to me i mean i, I tend to i don't know about you but in the afternoons and evenings. When I come home from work, most people want to go and have a glass of wine and chill out and lay down and watch the telly. I will walk through the door and I'll be like, right, let's go. <laughs> what are we all, what are we doing? <laughs> so I will start off by cooking dinner, then I'll call my mum. And by the end of it, by 10 o'clock, mm. I'm bouncing off the walls. Like I have more energy after work than I do in the morning. You know, I really, I sort of get higher and higher and higher and higher throughout the day. And so, in, you know, after, and also, you know, medication wise, I was taking mm. um, ADHD meds, which obviously are speedy. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, that, that's been one of the most complicated relationships I've had with my ADHD is hitting this absolute acute mania in the evenings. And then actually the only way I can bring myself down or manage that is with uh, benzos or sleeping pills, which is then causes a whole new I mean, what an ADHD start to this conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've gone right in. Yeah, straight in. No, <laughs> straight yeah. in well, with We me. skip the small talk, don't yeah, we? We right? don't worry about that. <laughs> but what, so if you look back into your earlier years, can you, can you, before YouTube was there, how did you manage with those episodes back then? Film as well. I could watch comedies all night. Yeah. Uh, I could, uh, you know, sometimes I'd get really stuck in, one of the things that he said, said about an item there was this book that used to soothe me. And even as an adult, I had this book, a noddy book, <laughs> that if I was feeling manic, I'd just mm. get it and it would soothe me. It would bring me down really quickly. And then I could sort of like fall asleep. But distraction is weird, isn't it? Like I, I need the distraction to pull mm. me in or out of things. Would you, what about cleaning? Never. Not in a million no. years. No. Yeah, it's funny. Loads of ADHD people love to clean. And whereas I'm like, you know, we have our chosen interests. Yeah. That's my one that is like, whoop. No, I'm... But then equally, if I was cooking, I could cook for hours and hours and mm. hours and, you know, have no, no qualms with that at all. So it's probably the same sort of thing. Mm. Do, 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 have you had a sense that you're different for, from a lot of your life? Yeah, really, very much so. I mean, when I was, a, when I was at school, okay, so I guess the, if we're looking at how this sort of thing panned out for me, my mum always used to say, when I, when I came, even came out the womb, I was just hyper distracted. She was like, you'd put, you'd be in a pram, I'd put you in the corner, 
you'd be wide awake, but mm. like your head would be somewhere else, <laughs> you know, and you'd be, she'd be like, mm. what the hell is this kid doing, you How, know? Literally from like toddler age. From, yeah, even in a pram, you know? Wow. So uh, that was kind of where it started. And mm. then, you know, she just knew that there'd be points where everyone else would be having conversations and I'd be somewhere else. And I guess like as a teenager um, at school, I remember, see, I have a bit of a different relationship than a lot than what I hear a lot of people having. Mm. And I and I want to kind of, it sounds kind of horribly conceited. So I have to be really careful in how I sort of word this. But I would be at school and I would knew um, I'd be like one ear on the classroom and I'd be able to still able, I would function really well mm. through this ear and I would get everything, but my brain would be somewhere else and often plotting my life, things that would actually turn out to happen. It was weird. This weird, I'm, I'm going to call it a manifesting space where my head was actually like creating what I was going to do for the rest of my life. It's so strange, you know, or I do, or then I'd either be in that zone or I'd doodle and I'd doodle through the whole mm. uh, lesson. If I had to do something, I would have picked up maybe not as much as somebody who was really focused, mm. but I still was picking up a lot of information, which I don't think a lot of people had. Did you store the information? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was doing really, my, my grades were good, mm. um, but I always got that cliche, like if she was in the room, mm. she would do so much better. You know, she's not pushing her capability. She's distracted. You know, where is her focus? What can she do to kind of draw herself back into the room? Um, and I was just like not interested in drawing myself back into the room. I was having a lovely time and I was getting the grades. What, what were you planning your life? <laughs> what, 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 was the, what did the plan look like when you were that age? God, um, I just, I can't even, I can't even remember details, but I know, I know it was like, I don't know. Like I knew that I wanted to, I knew that I, I just knew I was wanting to achieve stuff. That's all, mm. that's all I really remember in, in, sort of from those snippets, but it was, it was about, it was an ambitious things that I wanted to do, but mm. as, as far as the specifics go, I can't actually remember. But, that sounds, sounds really weird, but do you remember like what you did during the, the break times? Were you, did you have like, were you friendly with the other kids? So this is where I got hyperactive. So then I'd be running around like a lunatic. <laughs> I, mean, I used to pretend I was a horse and like, like sort of gallop around the, the um, playground mm. until I, you still had to stop doing that at a certain age. But, you know, it, I was the sort of person that was running around mm. frenzied. And I remember sort of knowing that I was, I suppose, a dopamine addict. If they, this is kind of what we all are, really, mm. from a very, very young age. You know, I needed, as soon as I realised the things you, you could get a buzz from and the things that made, you know, you get an adrenaline rush, mm. I got very into that very young. And I was doing drugs from the age of like 13, 14, and real, and that was kind of what took away a lot, a lot of those uh, big. Like I don't know, like it, it, that was where I fed fed that side of mm. of my brain and those yeah. things. What What do you think was it that drew you to to drugs at such a young age? Uh, gosh, loads of things. <laughs> Probably, I got quite I, in, in the same way. I was, I was sort of explained about fixations mm. and things I really enjoyed. I mean, I, I was into punk music from a very young age. I was obsessed with my big sister and she was into metal, got into metal. And then I discovered the punk scene through that. And then I started hanging out with a lot of street punks in Piccadilly Circus and drinking White Lightning Cider. <laughs> and then that gradually went into, you know, using a, a variety. I'm pretty much even from a very young age of all of the bad drugs, you mm. know. Um, but it was a good distraction. But also my father died when I was 15. And um, my mum kind of, she she was working abroad. She was working in Thailand. Mm. So I didn't get to see a lot of my family at all. I mean, I was with my younger sister and my big sister was looking after us. If she was in London, but she wasn't often. And then I looked after my little sister. Mm. And it was kind of, so it was kind of a good distraction. But it was a weird dichotomy of wanting to like, protect and manage my little sister and also uh be sort of appeasing this one side of my brain that needed uh some kind of distraction it's so interesting when when did you start to realize that there was something actually going on and there was an explanation behind this sort of lust for dopamine and excitement and going after things that perhaps some other people weren't 
I think uh, very early on, like I, I knew I was weird. I knew, I mean, a lot of people refer to themselves as weird as ADHD, but a different, I suppose that's the correct way of saying it nowadays. But I, I, I was a little weirdo. So, and I knew I was, and you know, I think I always knew that um, because I was always, I've always been told that I was difficult or um, I was a pain in the ass or I was like, <laughs> you know, too hyper or too, mm. you know, I was always that person. So you could not feel those things. But they were all kind of out of my control, so I had to accept mm. them, you know. And I guess maybe when you're starting to build friendships, uh, real friendships in your late teens, I guess, when you're like, okay, this is complicated. I'm a complicated person. I can't uh, have relationships in the same way as everyone else mm. does because they're either, you know, they're either really challenged by these sort of idiosyncrasies that I have or they're, I don't know, like... I don't know. I, 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 I was, you know, like I said, I, I've always been called the difficult one, mm. you know. Because of all of the comments that you, you've had over your life, you know, saying that you're, you're different and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you appear to be a confident woman. Are, are, mm. you, a, are you a confident yeah, person? extremely confident. Yeah. So that's the thing. This is what I was saying earlier. Even, even my attitude from when I was in that classroom, knowing my capabilities like literally over, uh, almost overconfidently. Mm. So I've been called um, arrogant a lot in my in my past because I feel I've got such a confident se sense of self uh, because I don't think a lot of people have ever had to have themselves projected back at them from such a young age. Mm. So I knew all of the powerful tools that I had, um, but I also knew that it came with a bit of a, you know, a, a, a complex side of things, which meant, difficult to have relationships mm. and you know fighting a lot and being quite angry as well you know how's your relationship like with rejection it's funny because i guess like my first job was modeling mm. so i've had to deal with rejection well with family stuff different but in work you know modeling i was getting rejected all the time you mm. know that was fine and then i kind of built up from there and then suddenly you're in media and there's, that's full of rejection but I also, for with each rejection, there'd be like five positives. Right. So I could kind of balance that in my head. I understood that you just got to keep plugging. And these are things that a lot of people don't learn young. Mm. And I was very privileged to have had those experiences, which meant that that also gave me an, a, you know, a sense of self where I was assured of, of certain things. I just knew that no matter what you did, if you carried on, you'd actually come out of something with, uh, you know, you, you would actually get there in the end, if mm. that makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. Um, yeah, so, where were we? Sorry, <laughs> then she gets distracted. <laughs> yeah. Do you think you're able to differentiate a uh, professional rejection, like a modeling job not going yeah. your way, to yeah, a personal stuff. rejection, yeah. like a romantic partner or so family member? rejection from a romantic partner is tricky. <laughs> this is going to sound really awful, because I intend to be the one who does a lot of the rejecting. Um, but abandonment is different. Like mm. if I feel like someone's abandoned me, but that's, that's not ADHD. That's like something that's happened elsewhere. Mm. That's, but yeah, do I handle it worse? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what, what, when I'm in crisis point, my crisis, crisis is like 20 mm. times more, uh, explicit than what I feel like everyone else is dealing with. Is there something, do you, do you think, do you know where that abandonment comes from? That there those... That's yeah, hard. completely. I mean, but that, that you know, that's to do with my mum vanishing off the face of the earth, my father mm. dying. My father, before he died, was uh, had moved to a different country and we didn't really hear from him until he came home mm. to die. How old were so, you when he, when he left? He left when I was about 13. Okay. Um, so all of the, the naughty sort of stuff that went alongside mm. with the ADHD um, kind of came probably from those things as well, which is also something which I find really interesting because you've got your sort of, your build of your brain mm. when you're a neurodivergent person then you've obviously got the things which affect that through your daily challenges you know mm. what, what do you think are the main challenges that you come across with with your adhd traits anger is my heart the anger is the one which i struggle with the most because i have i've also been diagnosed with the odd which is oppositional defiance disorder yeah i'm fascinated by that <laughs> Can you explain what that is so it's really when i mean i'm not very good with authority if anyone mm. tells me what to do it's like uh, uh um and also the problem with it is this is the arrogant side of me 
often I'm right in everything. So, <laughs> and I really am. And so when, and I think because I have this confident self, self mm. sense of self, also, even if I'm, I'm wrong, uh, the path that I want to achieve tends to be the, the sort of very clear vision that I have, whereas other people might not see mm. it. And if I don't get to do that, I become very explosive. Also, if somebody, I don't know, how else does it happen? Yeah. The only other times that that pops up is when I've been abandoned or feel like I'm being abandoned. Mm. It doesn't, I don't have to manage, I don't, I'm not able to manage that whether I am being or aren't being, but the feeling that I get when I'm being abandoned is explosive. You know, I get, I get, it's instant trauma response. How does that explosiveness pair up when you're in, in your romantic life? Oh, it's been an absolute fucking nightmare. <laughs> because, but also because I think the men that I've chosen, because mm. I have, am this dopamine addict, I like, I mean, I'm sure it's kind of, it's quite common knowledge that all I tend to do is go out with rock stars. So that's not a good, <laughs> that's not always going to be a good shout yeah. when it comes down to, uh, you know, you've got these two very strong-minded creative people who, you know, but yeah, it's interesting. And also... Also, it's having to work out where your culpabilities, your responsibilities are in this and what are the things which are enhancing those feelings, mm. you know, and I have taken drugs for like 25 years. You know, I kind of like put all this to side only in, in the last couple of years where I, I got sober. My boyfriend is sober. I drink now. But, you know, I've, I've really got a handle on that situation because I, well, I'm an addict. I sort of feel like my, my requirements for drinking and drug taking were definitely appeasing a, a sort of more something which I can manage, you know, whereas, you know, my boyfriend, for example, is, is a, you know, he, he still needs to go to AA and things like that. Whereas I feel like I have got a grip on that stuff. But I, you know, I think I had to be, but, but you know, the reason my relationship works now mm. is because we've both taken a very responsible look at all of our internal fuck ups and works on them really hard and that's what's made it work because we have loved each other that much now most of the time it's hard i have these like extreme romances that are definitely fitting that dopamine mm. um addiction but they're not serving me in so many other ways and you don't tend and to find somebody who's prepared to put all of those things uh you know to to fight for you based and actually fight for you through their own ego is actually quite a hard thing. Mm. I'm just very privileged at the moment. Everything seems to be going thoroughly well for me two years into a relationship because we've, I found somebody who wants to do that and I wanted to do it for mm. them. Yeah. But that's that's culpability. That's like having a big slap around the face and going, "This I want to be with this person enough to mm. sort my shit out. It sounds like you really complement each other. And yeah. I suppose as you get experience and you can draw on past relationships and you... Uh, you can really appreciate the value in understanding and awareness of, of how you are with people. Completely. And it sounds like you brought that into the, your current relationship. Yeah. And it's going I amazing. mean, we, we had to break up for it to work. Mm. You know, we had to go away and both get help for it to work. When we broke up, I didn't know it was going to work. work. Mm. But what we did was so powerful individually that by the time we got back together, we were like, we're not fucking this up again. Plus the way, which I won't tell you, that it exploded in the end was uh, so dangerous that you we couldn't go back there, you know? But it's funny, because I've probably been in the most toxic relationship of my life with the person I'm feeling the most stable and safe with. Mm. So we had these two separate relationships. First three months was like, whoa. <laughs> and now I'm like, hey, <laughs> you know, this is, I'm, I'm calm mm. for the first time in my life. What did the first three months look like? Oh, bad, yeah. Really, really explosive. I probably don't want to talk about that one. That too much. Oh, though, sure. If that's all right. Yeah, yeah. Would you have any tips for anyone who's who's neurodivergent in a relationship, having struggles with rage or mm. uh, anger outbursts? Any any strategies that you could pass on? There's so many things you can do, and and it all starts with you know trying to unpick. I mean, this is just classic therapy, which. Which I've got a complicated relationship because I've been in therapy since mm. I was fifteen. Because you know that that was the first time I ever had somebody sort of like turn the mirror at me and go, right, this is we've got to start unpicking you from them. So I've done years and years and years of that, but I've never really taken myself into that room and gone, 
okay, I'm here. I'm mm. actually available to do this right now. Because I, I always, it was just almost like, I mean, I've been in anger management five times and it was only the last time, which was a very specific ADHD led anger management course, which mm. I actually got anything out of it because actually I just wasn't available. I wasn't there to do, I was, I was in the room, but I wasn't in the room, if you know what I mean. So, um, you know, one day I just was like, this is ludicrous. Something happened that was so crazy. Mm. Actually, I had a, a few years of crazy. You know, I lost a lot of my businesses. Um, I lost, I was in a very weird relationship, which was just like slightly Stockholm syndrome that I had a lot of like stuff to get through after that relationship. So I started doing a very specific type of therapy, which was really, um, that really, that was really, um, influential to how I suddenly started look, re-looking at my life. But I find therapy really difficult because I find all the therapy talk fucking drives me insane. I'm like, I don't buy into half of it. And it's just like half of it, I just feel like I'm too smart. I've done it for so long and I'm just mm. too, too smart. I've seen it all before. I'm just like, <laughs> I get really bored. Bored and, um, and uh, despondent about it mm. all. What sort of, I mean, it's obviously very individualistic. I've, I've never had therapy, but it's something I've, I've, I'm thinking about. And I just wondered what it looks like for someone who's been there. Mm. So, okay, so this is why I have a problem with therapy. A lot of the time you walk into a room and somebody's trying to find, like to, we could, we're calling it unpicking, right? They tries to take, away, take your life and break it apart to find out exactly why you have these responses, right? Mm. Um. And often you have to go through looking at what your parents did. <laughs> okay, so the, your poor parents get all of the shit. And most of the time they probably deserve it a little bit. But what I feel like is that they don't force the responsibility back onto yourself. That you're, bit, you're told often that you're, it's okay, this happened because of this, because of what happened here. Mm. And I just don't feel like that's what actually that's that's serving anyone other than making a whole world of loads of narcissistic people who think it's okay but that they feel the way that they did because their families made them that person now i want to be responsible for myself and yes of course you have to look at that but every time you restart with a therapist that's where you go and so i've i've had to restart with a lot of therapists and i've had mm. to go back to my family stuff a lot and i just switch off at that point which is really terrible but it's the truth <laughs> Is there anything else you do that that helps you really build self awareness and and manage what you consider to be like the, the struggles that come with your 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 condition? Well, medication first and mm. foremost. You know, I was so when I got diagnosed with ADHD, I was probably twenty five. First of all, I'm forty four now. So actually, no, I wasn't twenty five. I was about twenty eight. Mm. Um, I'm forty four now, so it was a long time ago. No medication at all, and then started to have a, a few problems. Like my anger was becoming a real issue. And I think my anger was getting worse because I was busier. My career started to come up. Mm. Um, I was sort of doing, I was going all around the world filming, you know, TV, like cookery shows, documentaries, like, re and also my my investment in a lot of these things is I, I am completely invested and I want to be part of the production team. So it wasn't just me t showing up as talent. I'd be in all the sort of pre-production meetings and in the edits and all of that. So mm. I, my time was getting consumed with all of this sort of work and added work. And then I'd be still, because as an ADHD person, I'm sure you're the same. You can, you're really good at ideas. And yes. so I'd be creating ideas and trying to come up with new shows at the same time. Yes. And <laughs> and it's like, you know, your, your head is completely consumed. But that's mm. the great thing about ADHD people is that when they are entirely focused, we have this hyper-focus, which makes us capable and superhuman and able to do all these things that, you know, but it does get on top of you. It does burn you out eventually. Mm. So um, anyway, went back in and was getting more and more angry and irritated. And I was feeling that people who I were working with couldn't keep up with me mm. or uh, I was getting people getting annoyed with me. And it was just suddenly I, it, it became fairly explosive even at work. Um, and then I got re-diagnosed properly with, and with actually, you know, knowing that we had the, well, it was in those days. See, I don't know. I, I don't know what actually it comes across as now. But I was, I was told I had three types of ADHD, which was hyperactive, distracted, and combined. Right. But now I think you are either combined and you have both of the two, mm. or you don't. So back back then it was three types, but I think it's now like two types, or you are combined. Mm. Um. 
so, and then when I went to have start having therapy, there was a woman there who she was like, look, we're working with a hospital and I can't really remember the name of the hospital, classic. Um, but they're doing sort of proper clinical trials. Right. Do you, we were looking for females with, with ADHD. Mm. Do you want to come in, on board? So that was really interesting. I was like, fuck yeah, this is really cool. <laughs> this is the sort of shit I can get behind. So mm. that became really interesting for me. Um, and I had loads of things, you know, I had brain scans, I had my blood taken. I was like put on all of these mad things where people would be, I'd be having conversations with people for two hours and they'd send me on these weird tangents to see, just having a chat about how I would react and respond to them um, while I was having my brain scanned and stuff. Mm. So it was, it was really interesting. So I felt really like I saw a lot of how this works, which was, which I, again, huge privilege. Mm. Um, and then I started getting put on all the medications. Uh, so I try, I trialed about six of them, but obviously they were all in, you know, all the classics, Ritalin, Adderall, in different uh, combinations and varieties mm. of strengths and things. And then uh, was on Nelvance for quite a while. And, you know, all of these things were great. They worked for me. In a short period of time, they all worked for me. And they have been entirely helpful in certain parts of management. But I find that because our, you know, I don't know about you, like I'm never the same day to day. Every single day will offer me a new challenge or a new hurdle. And I was taking these things. Uh, you know, what, what I was finding ADHD medication was really good for was getting me to focus when mm. I was unable to focus. So if I was in an attentive type and I was, you know, hyper, hyper distracted, they'd be great at getting me to focus and be able to do the job in hand. You know, my, my assistant used to say, you'd be on the ceiling and you'd be able to be like suddenly pulled down and be able to do the job. Yeah. Maybe still have to have a walk around the block a few times, but, <laughs> but I was still, I was able to be functional. Mm. Whereas if I was hyperactive, they made me worse. So I don't always feel like the meds, how they are, have been helpful. Whereas I'm now on cyclothermic medication. I'm off ADHD meds. First of all, I was taken off them and put onto high volumes of DHAs and Omegas. So really high quality. What's DHAs? So they're, they, you tend to find them in fish oils. Okay. Um, so they are a, God, I, I see this is where my ADHD is, doesn't serve me is because I'm not massively interested. So I haven't <laughs> obtained information. Mm. What I do know is that they are really brilliant for helping your brains. And, I, but the high volumes can mm. work in a way that they stabilize your brain in the same way that, um, the ADHD medication does. And so I was taken off the meds and put on like t like 2.5 grams of fish oil, which is an extraordinarily high amount. And they really did help, mm. you know. And eventually I was taking, um, very early on taking lion's mane, which I think is one of the most brilliant things you can do for your brain uh, if you've got an ADHD brain. Lion's mane is being used in things, uh, mm. trials for dementia and loads of, you know, extreme Parkinson's and things like that. So it's it's the real deal. Mm. But I also then started taking a lot of um, psychedelics and psilocybin was really helpful to me. So I, I started to microdose and didn't find it didn't, it was kind of like, it, it didn't, it didn't suit me. Whereas I then started to macrodose. So every sort of 10 days to two weeks, I take quite a large dose of mm. mushrooms, about a, a gram and a half to two grams. And that really started to help. So for anyone listening, who's not sure, psilocybin, what's that? It's in magic mushrooms. So is that, I suppose people would be familiar with the term like psychedelics? Yeah, it's psychedelic. Yeah. And so how, how, what does that feel like taking that? I mean, I, I what's really great for me is it also helps with addiction. So mm. since I put everything to the side, it's been amazing. Um, at helping me keep on a on a level playing field. It just kind of calms everything. Your pineal eye gets opened up and you, you see everything more clearly. You hear mm. everything, like all your senses are really pushed to to the, the sort of lengths of where they probably should be, that we kind of have them dulled down where, you know, over uh, just because of life mm. really and particularly technology and all of those things which take away the sort of sharpness that we can actually access. So what it just does is it reinstates that. But it is, it does, it's now proven to rebuild brain cells mm. and, um, you know, open those channels um, up to be able to access your brain in a way that you used to be able to. Like I, I also think technology has a real huge impact on uh ADHD brains, but also everyone's brains. You know, our phones are the biggest, you know, 
that you, you're getting a dopamine buzz from them all day mm. throughout the day. <clears throat> and that gives you a, a version. It's not ADHD. Mm. It gives you a version of, of what we think to be ADHD because you're suddenly distracted by this. And this is what's giving you thrills, mm. which is what happens with us, you know? Yes, I think I think uh, social media should come with a health warning in the same way that <laughs> cigarettes and alcohol does. Yeah, I saw. I think it's almost as worse even, yeah. We I mean, never in history of time have you been able to reach into your pocket and within a couple of seconds get a flood of and just be in hysterics you go on instagram you watch yeah. a reel and you can be yeah. go from you know doing nothing to be laughing your ass off in less than five seconds and never in history has that been accessible yeah. to humans yeah and of course that's going to be addictive yeah that and rush of dopamine exactly because it's giving us all these sort of things that we need mm. to feed up to feed our egos or to feed you know just something it nourishes something in us but it isn't it's like a false economy mm. So I was just go back, going back to the medication. So all in all, would you like? How would you describe your experience with the prescribed ADHD medication? Yeah, uh, like I said, it was good. It was good when I need when I needed focus. It was great mm. for the focus. And all some of the but, side effects. But the problem was was that I. It's also given me a the hardest addiction I had to come out of, which mm. was an addiction to benzos and sleeping pills, which I've been addicted to since I was put on ADHD medication, mm. if I'm completely honest. And every time I've tried to come off it is when I've hit cyclothermia. Mm. So it's really, it's 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 a complicated beast. It's created more problems for me than it probably should have. And I really wish that doctors who were prescribing it were like, you really, you know, the reason that kids in America, I mean, probably here as well, but we can refer to America who are using them as study drugs is because at the moment you need to study, they're great for focus in that moment. Mm. And that's really kind of how we should be using them. Not every single day when you wake up. I mean, giving a child a, a stimulant every single day is an extremely weird thing for like brain growth. At the same time, I can see completely why maybe just at school, those days it's really important. Mm. But it's, it's, you know, this is where we've got to be look at ourselves as individuals. You know, that's what, that's what I struggled with with it. And I wish that I'd known, because like I said, I, I got into a real problem with uh, being addicted to sleeping pills, mm. like an extremely bad problem. I was taking, uh, at my worst, I was taking probably two Russian Xanaxes, which I was getting off the dark web, which was another one of my obsessions, <laughs> <laughs> um, every single day mm. with um, two diazepam, uh, two Zolpidin, which are Ambien. Um, and four night nurse. That was like my nightly routine. Gosh. We'd lock out a fucking horse. Right. Yeah. But I, I, for some reason, I just needed it every day. Mm. And that's, you know, taken me about four or five years to get out of that. And I still have to take mm. half of a sleeping pill every night because of anxiety of sleep, not being able to sleep more than maybe mm. not being able to. But that's been the hardest thing for me. What do you think your sort of go-to is now for dopamine and excitement? Well, yeah, I mean, since I quit drinking and I, mean, I, do, I do drink again now, by the way, I sort of, I, it's been a sort of two year uh, journey of trying to work out exactly what my relationship is with all these things. Mm. And I've, alcohol was never my problem. Drugs always were. So I drink alcohol when I'm eating food, maybe once or twice a week. I'll have a martini and a glass of red wine and I'm very satisfied. Yeah. On a weekend, <laughs> I might have a Bloody Mary and a glass of wine, but that's, I'm fine with that. And I can manage that. That's really is it all I need. And I'm very good at being disciplined in that. Um, you don't but, find that it, it how much alcohol do you need or have you needed in the past for it to kind of like trigger that gateway to crave something more extreme yeah I think the problem with me was uh, I was never a sort of like let's get let's get a bit pissed and I'll call in the bag that was never me I was a hoarder so I'd always have something in the cupboard something um, and I'd want to get fucked up and then I was mm. the feeder I'd be like oh everyone come oh. back to mine because I've got shit stacks of stuff so um, so that's actually been, you know, since putting that aside, which has been a good couple of years now, mm. I am very into funfair rides. I mean, like you, we both live in Brighton. Yes. I mean, I live in London half the week and Brighton the other half. And me and my boyfriend have like, because we're re really into the pier and going on the waltzes. <laughs> it's like the best <laughs> bars ever. And also running around Brighton, like we're jacked up on like popcorn and candy floss and yeah. sugar like we're like we live there because it's like it's fun so we're taking advantage of what brighton really has to offer mm. and we're like bouncing around going bowling or going to the like day glow mini golf it's just like yeah. really having lots of <laughs> lots of like child like fun mm. and it's been brilliant and you know this year i'm 
I'm vowing, because unfortunately the medication I'm on for cyclothermic disorder, which is the best medication I've ever been on, by the way, it's the one thing that has completely stabilized me as well um, over any ADHD medication. And it is more of a sedative. It's actually an antipsychotic, uh, which sounds really terrifying, but you take it in such small doses. It's not, you know, they, you, it's used to treat everyone from people with cyclothermic all the way through to schizophrenia, right. you know? So just quickly, what's cyclothermic? So cyclothermic is, as I explained at the beginning, it's when you have an AD, when you have ADHD and instead of calming down throughout the day, you get more and more buzzed. Right, got you. And, uh, and, you, and you can spiral out of control into a cyclothermic space, which is, it's an acute mania. Um, and it's, you know, like I, I, I sort of know I'm in it. And I think that's the difference with bipolar is a lot of the time you don't know you're manic. Whereas I, I kind of do because I'm, it's like I'm on drugs and I'm not, you know. Um, and it's like having to suddenly, you know, like I said, I'll, I'll get into bed and instead of being uh, able to sort of put myself to sleep, mm. I'll be like doing everything I can to stay awake um, and getting into these like absolute, you know, fully focused holes of something I'm interested in. Um so th those meds the, have been brilliant and they've they managed the ADHD symptoms that I need because my, the, despite having, you know, combined type, I really have more of a problem with being uh, hyperactive. Mm. So that really does sort that out and it makes me be able to sleep and it makes me be able to calm down in the evenings and it's, you know, it's really changed mm. my life for the better. I mean, congratulations on, you know, overcoming an, an, an addiction. I think you know, I've spoken to so many people mm. There's, there's such a big overlap between ADHD and neurodivergence and addiction, mm. you know, and, and I've certainly been on my journey with it. You've been on your journey. So I think you've clearly got that in your past and you've mm. overcome it and you've, ha you've got an awareness of it. So I think that's, you know, to be applauded. Yeah, you have to. And this is what I mean about responsibility and culpability in your own self. Like uh, there is no doubt that these things exasperated every single one of my symptoms. There's mm. just no way they didn't even though that it was part of a symptomatic thing anyway you mm. know it's kind of like we are searching for these acute buzzes and mm. um and so you do end up finding yourself into these in in these sort of situations but everyone i know who's got adhd pretty much i mean this mm. probably says a lot about my social circle has got problems with addiction as well mm. and it just seems to come hand in hand and if it's not an addiction that is like societally looked down upon, like a drug or an alcohol or something, it's generally another addiction. Yeah. Whether addiction to a person or yeah, sugar absolutely. or computer games. Fixations as well. It's yeah. like there are addictions which bring fixations, you know. Mm. Um, and also, weirdly, these addictions create some kind of comfort as well. Yeah. Because they're probably the thing that you've used early on. Mm. You know, I don't believe in masking. This is a lot of the time I see this language in ADHD. And masking is the one thing that I just don't buy at all. Like you've got to remember it's a hyperactive, it's an impulsive disorder, right? You mm. don't have control over your impulsive. So I I've never really understood how somebody can manage uh, their disorder by masking. Like mm. I have no control over myself. Like that's the whole point in ADHD. Mm. You know, I definitely think we go a bit weird and internalize things, but masking, I'm not sure if, it, mm. if that's even possible. I know it's never been possible for me, but we do have coping me mechanisms for sure. Definitely, yeah. I think I can see. I, 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 def, I definitely, for example, I think I'm autistic as well. I haven't been diagnosed mm. yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm on that process. And I think there's some situations where I definitely force myself in really consciously to be something that I'm not feeling like in that particular moment. Yeah. But that contradicts sometimes my ADHD, which is very impulsive. Yeah. But so that's you can remember masking is is a something that was created for the autistic people, right? Mm. It's, it is a very autistic thing. It's not an ADHD thing. Right. So, you know, if you are, if you do find out you are autistic, then that would explain those things. Mm. Um, it's only recently, and because of the internet, been brought into the language of what ADHD stands for. And, and that's where there are so many, because there are a lot of people who are both autistic and ADHD, but I think first and foremost, you would be autistic. I have two nephews that are autistic. One of them goes to special school and he's not, what you would consider very autistic, but he's mm. sort of mid to kind of quite autistic, you know, and he, he still has to go to a special school. When I look at people like that, and the, what again, that the ambition for what they're trying to achieve in their life and what my sister as a parent is trying to achieve for her son's life. And then you've got people now hearing these words and the buzzwords run, run alongside them. And I, this is not about me trying to diagnose anybody around me or be a gatekeeper for anyone around me, but 
I can't help but get frustrated where people are, are learning how to diagnose themselves from the internet or seeing these, you know, I mean, I get about 20 different ADHD quizzes popping up into my social media every day now mm. because it's obviously something we're following, we're both interested in. I get them the whole time. And they're a crock of shit. None of them mean that you've got ADHD. They've just got certain things. My friends go, I walk into a room and I forget what I'm doing. I'm like, every motherfucker has that, you know, and show me someone who doesn't get that once or, or twice a week even, you know, not even in their lifetimes, mm. weekly. That is just being a normal person who just is forgetful because we've got busy minds. Mm. You know, it doesn't make you ADHD. It's just like these kind of ways that, I, I mean, I fell out with a friend, very, my best friend of, my whole entire life who believes she's autistic. I don't believe she's autistic, but who am I to tell her that? But I really don't. But I think we've got to be responsible as well for the other people who are, who need diagnosis. We're in an epidemic at the moment. Mm. There's way too many people um, trying to get diagnosis for something that, why? What do you want out of this diagnosis? Are you extremely ill to the point of needing this to save your mental health? Like absolutely save your mental health because if you're if you're not then you know clear up a place on that list that's now five six years long for somebody who desperately needs it like I, I you know I would even question anybody who needs their sort of autism diagnosis do you really need it at our age how old are you uh, I'm 35 yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean you we've survived up until now mm. right it's the things that make you want to want to die maybe that our, our age that we should be pushing ourselves into and if that is the case of course mm. you go for that but if it's just like mm, I don't feel completely right I can relate to some autistic traits we're holding up this space now for people who desperately need it and my nephew is is somebody who's not getting the help he needs because of this list being consumed by people who are reading that they think that they have ADHD and autism mm. online and I'm not pointing at you, by the way. This is just like me using, <laughs> using you as yeah, yeah, an example yeah. for everyone else, you know. No, it's interesting. I think, I think, uh, yeah, I agree. I think the masking is more of it's it's more in line with the traits of autism. Of course, mm. it is. I think if you, but I think it's very difficult to say somebody is ADHD, but then say that they probably do also have autistic traits. Like I think there's lots of studies that show a Venn diagram yeah. between like ADHD people and autism, and there's a huge overlap. Most people with ADHD have but autistic first, traits. Your first autistic though, I don't think it's the other way around. Like mm. that's how I see it. Autism is a far more complicated beast. You know, yes, it's spectral and yes, but you know, it's com I think one of the, the complicated spaces with autism is now they've taken away Asperger's, which doesn't, mm. you know, you're either mildly autistic or you know that Asperger's isn't really a condition anymore. And that's a shame because that really would be like ADHD with Asperger's traits for me is such a clear space, which is what I feel like a lot of my friends who mm. feel like this probably sit in that spectrum, right? But it's not there anymore. And unfortunately, the second you go onto that fully autistic spectrum, even if you are very mild, you're still taking needs from somebody who is, you know, mid or extremely autistic uh, all the way to, to extremely. And that is a frustration for me because being extremely autistic Unfortunately, it is a disability. It is. It sits into that space. Mm. So it's my, my nephew would be considered to, to be disabled, even though I feel like he's functioning in so many ways, but he cannot go to a regular school. He cannot function. He's got no friends, not one friend. You've got friends? No. <laughs> Yay, I'm your friend. <laughs> I don't no, believe I, that. No, I, I, I really struggle to make friends. Yeah. I mean, my, my, I think my neurodivergence enables me in many ways but i think it really it holds me back a lot mm. um it's nearly killed me i've, I've yeah. drank myself to death i can't uh the anxiety i'm, I'm incredibly good at hiding it mm. um if anyone were to look at me from the outside they think oh he's he's made a success for himself he mm. must he must be all oh i agree with that by the way but That's... behind the scenes there's often i had a panic attack last week i didn't tell anyone so there's a yeah. side to it that is definitely there and well, there it's a constant go. battle and so you need you need that help you mm. really need that help. There's a, there is a difference. There are a lot of people who just feel like they want to know. Mm. And there's the difference. It's like you need to be able to manage that. Not you. People need to understand yeah. what their what the relevance of the role of knowing that they that they want to know that they're either on the ADHD or autistic spectrum. What that what they want with from it, other than just to know. Mm. What are you doing with that information? Are you changing something in your life that's really critical, or are you just knowing? You know. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, it does. I mean, I think with self-diagnosis, if you if you don't if you don't want medication, then you don't. I don't think you necessarily need a, a professional I to say that you have a condition. Unless you want to go private, then I, I suppose you're not holding up but the even queue. Even though you are, though, private the private queues are like two years now. It's really hard to get diagnosis full stop. But mm. I, yeah, if you can afford private, you should go on that private thing for sure. It's it's a really horrible space out there, mm. and unfortunately, you know, again, it's annoying because the more we talk, this is why I don't want to go on to things like this because the more we talk about it, the more people relate to it. And the more people want diagnosis. So it's like a, you know, well, at the same time, we're making people feel comfortable knowing that mm. they're the same as us. And we've got people out there that they can relate to. But it's it's what's more important. And it's hard to manage now. And I feel like what's more important right at this moment is getting the people who really need diagnosis on that on that list. And we all need to know in ourselves, right, how important is this? And like I said, if it's, you know, creating extremely bad habits uh, or it's, you know, or it's making you want to, you know, if you're, if you're like extremely depressed or, you know, all of these mm. things that then of course you go and you find out, you don't put your own mental health uh, not at stake, but if it's just something you're like, Oh, I read these things and I think mm. I'm like that. I suppose the difficulty is drawing the distinction between yeah. somebody who might've just seen something on TikTok and mm. thought, Oh, I leave my keys in the room. Sometimes I'll go get assessed and then hold up yeah. the queue between somebody, which is a lot of people who have genuinely been really, really struggling mm. all of their life and they don't know why. Mm. And then they've seen something on TikTok and that, mm. and then they go seek assessment. Yeah, sure. There are some people, a lot of people who have been really, really struggling for a long time and then mm. they're, they're seeking answers. And there probably is a small number of people who see something on TikTok and then go decide to yeah. seek assessment because they're bored or they're they, they just want something to do. And I suppose, where do you draw the line between that person and, and the, the, the the person who's really, really struggling? Well, I well exactly. And that, but that surely comes down to an, uh, your own responsibility in yourself, like knowing what your ambition is. That, mm. that's, it really is as simple as that. You know, you do know what your, you know, you know whether you want to die or not. You know whether you're an alcoholic or you've got problems with addictions or mm. not. You know those things and you should be able to be clear about like right now, this is not, I'm not coping. I really desperately need help. I need mm. to get on that list. You know, yeah. that is that is where you go yeah. from there. Because there are a lot of, I mean, we know suicide is five times higher yep, for people with, with you. undiagnosed ADHD. And that yep. is, it happens between the age of 30 and 45. Yeah. So people within that age group, my age group, your age group, yeah. and people older, like you could argue that for them, it's urgent that they seek assessment. I, I totally and, agree and with that, by the way. I think that, that is urgent. Um, that for me is extreme an extreme situation that requires urgent urgent care. You know, I mean, a lot of people that I know who've who've are in the position that I want to help them are in this situation. You know, but I also know a lot of people who are just curious. You no, know, and that's the difference. You know, just knowing what your what your position is and freeing up that space for somebody who is extremely ill or somebody who is a child. Mm. You know. Yeah, I think the responsibility, like you said, definitely has to lie on the person. If you are really somebody who thinks, who's just going for an assessment because they think they've seen a video of them, mm. oh, I'm, I miss my train once a month, I'm going to go get assessed <laughs> for ADHD, then yeah, of course, that person's silly and mm. wasting valuable Q yeah. space in the NHS. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it has to rely within the person. Mm. I genuinely think, I hope anyway, my, most people who seek assessment are doing so because they're desperate mm. um, and, and they, they desperately need I don't feel help. like that. that yeah, I, would, I would hope, but I know that they're not, mm. you know? I, know. I know probably about 20 people who are on that list right now who I personally, and that's, again, it's not up to me to determine, mm. but I know these people well enough to know the, their, you know, internal feelings. And I know that they just want to know. And that they feel like that it's their right to know. So therefore they are entitled to go on that list. Mm. And that's something I really struggle with. I find it really, really hard to, um, yeah, anyway. And I've been, you know, it's something I've said out loud before. And it's the reason I don't want to do these sorts of things is because it upsets people who want to be part of, there is a crew out there for ADHD people as well. It's cool. Young people think it's cool. You know, people who are a lot younger than us think it's cool. So they will want to get on lists and that's it. Not all of them. There, there mm. is a lot of people out there who just want to be diagnosed because it's it's a cool creative thing to have. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it definitely has a, a certain, 
what do you think when people say it's just a trend? Because I, going on from what you just said, I agree. A lot of the social media content has kind of shaped it into something that's kind of a cool label to have and therefore probably is enticing a, a, a number of people to go and seek that assessment because they want that label. Well, you know, there is there is also the fact that with the, in the DSM-5 that it doesn't, it's not really a condition. That doesn't mean it isn't a condition, by the way. That's just in, in the one book which tends to hold all of these mental health and um, neurodivergent lists mm. of what actually are things. It's, it doesn't, it's in there, but it doesn't really claim it to be uh, a real condition. I mean, it, this sort of goes back to the fact that there is an alternative condition out there, which is this dopamine addiction, you know, which gives off the same feelings and the same vibes. It's, it affects your attention. It makes you hyperactive. It makes you panic. It makes you uh, have huge anxiety. Mm. It gives you self-doubt, self-worth, like lack of self-worth. Um, you need it because it's an addiction. Um, you are constantly getting the the um, appeasing feeling that you get from something that gives you that you're addicted to. Now, I think ninety percent of people who might think that they've got ADHD probably have this. It can send you crackers as well. By the way, it's not it's not just about um, you know it, it's it's an it's an extreme thing, and it can send people you know mad, and it also sends people into that sort of. Yeah, it's opening up another can of worms, which I probably don't want to go into too much, but things like BPD and bipolar and mm. all of those things, which are less um, how your brain is built as a neurodivergent person being built with a completely different brain. Let's remember that. Real ADHD and autism and dyslexia, your brain are is a different creature, right? We're built completely mm. differently versus what addiction to dopamine actually does to you. And I, I think that that, you know, we've just gone through a huge trauma in that we've had uh, COVID. And I mean, I was petrified at the beginning of that, like absolutely petrified. Then you got to the point where you weren't allowed out and everything, everything runs off our phones now, you know? So there is no way that this is not a thing. Mm. There's no way that this is not a modern problem. Do you know what I mean? It's like... Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it, there, there, there's life events that happen that can trigger the traits that you associate with ADHD. But we yeah. know ADHD, the traits have to be persistent throughout your entire life and they yeah. have to cause significant distress for you to yeah. seek a diagnosis. And I mean, of course, things like COVID would yeah. have made people, the cost of living crisis right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, so many things. We've got this, we are in this point point in life where there are these constant mm. traumas. And within the constant trauma, you mm. know, if what the, most people would say, if something awful was happening in your life, you need to get away from it. So take yourself away mm. from your phone. Now we can't do that. My life runs out of my phone, literally runs out of my phone. My business is run from it. You know, I can't take myself. I can't remove myself from that. And it, and it undeniably, even as an ADHD person, it undeniably affects everything. So, you know, I'm definitely worse for it. Now, what I feel like is there are a lot of people who I don't feel like are neurodivergent, but they do have all of these symptoms. But there must, I mean, it's tricky though, but what is the conclusion for that? What is the solution? Well, it's not being diagnosed as ADHD and going on ADHD medication, but it is probably some some specific type of therapy. Now, how do we judge what is what, particularly with the in the current sort of crisis uh, for for ADHD when your diagnosis is all based on a list? You know, you look at my mm -hmm. diagnosis, which was based on you know brain scans and being plugged up to machines <laughs> while I was having a conversation. You know, mm. that and, and blood being taken. You know, that those are the differences. You know, we can't, there isn't the funding, there isn't the time to do this with everyone. So it's got to be a general generic list. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a very subjective diagnosis, right? Yeah. Um, and I had a psychiatrist, one of the leading assessors for ADHD sat, sat where you are. He said he often has to, people come in really excited, excited <laughs> because they, they, they think that they've got ADHD. Yeah. They've seen something and he has to tell them you don't have ADHD. Oh, you've got this guy. BPD <laughs> or, or or you've got social anxiety. Yeah, that so he, social anxiety is a huge one. He said well. often the traits of social anxiety. He said if you can be in a social situation, be incredibly anxious, incredibly forgetful, incredibly impulsive, these are all responses to social anxiety. But if yeah. you're sat at home and you're able to watch TV calmly and yeah. function at home, then you probably don't have ADHD. Yeah. It's probably just very circumstantial traits because yeah. of an anxiety response. Yeah. He echoed what, what 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 you're saying. I think there are lots of conditions that mirror the traits of ADHD. Mm. And when you've got the amount of content that you see on social media, that's almost making it, in some cases, a trendy condition to have. Um, 
that you can see why so many people are going to come forward and, and see them see those traits in themselves. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, the, the internet and, and uh, social media make sort of simple sort of short sightedness of so many things, whether it's a diet, we all like rather than being told to eat less calories and have a sort of uh, low GI diet, which is probably the most sensible thing. We're told to eat like cannibals or, you know, go mm. on this macrobiotic or just drink uh, broth or fast. You know, all these things are so extreme. And for some reason, humans prefer the extreme solution because mm. it's sort of clear cut, but it's not really. Whereas we're all individuals. Everyone has different, different requirements. Everyone's going to have different ticks. Everyone's experiences are different. Mm. These one sort of size fits all solutions, which is now what ADHD has sadly become. When we know how complicated ADHD is, it's not. It's not about one size fits all. It's mm. really crack. You know, like it's really complicated. Yeah, that was incredibly nuanced. You've seen one yeah, person nuanced. with ADHD, and you've you've met one person. It's it's such an umbrella diagnosis, right? It al almost almost sort of loses meaning in a way. Mm. You've got basically you've got a it's a neurological disorder that that shows up through traits of restlessness, forgetfulness, impulsivity. That's kind of the the headlines. Yeah. And if you tick enough boxes, you'll get a diagnosis. And so loads of people will have ADHD, mm. but it's because it's such a vast umbrella mm. of a spectrum, then it, it just shows up so differently. In what, so do you, many what do you think the solution is then? Because I'm really intrigued. I, I wish that we knew that. It's like, mm. what is the solution for this? I think it's it got to be individualistic. Right? Yeah. You've got to do exercises to build your own self-awareness and everyone needs to do that. I don't think you can watch a TikTok video and see somebody talking about it and change how you behave based on that person mm. because that person's them and you're yourself. I yeah. think you need to really, however you do it, meditation, journaling, mm. ex exercise, like build, really become an expert at knowing what you're good at, what your struggles are and working out ways to make your life more manageable. Everyone's yeah. got to do that. Everyone's got to take responsibility for their own self, mm. right? Because everyone, like you said, is unique. Yeah. I think I think it's got to be that. And now has to be, sadly, I wish there was the funding for it to be put onto the health system, but it's not. There isn't. So therefore, unfortunately, it does have mm. to land in the hands. I mean, it's interesting. There's a, a friend of mine has launched a um, neurodivergent product, which is, you know, meant to, from a natural perspective, work in the same way as medication, maybe even better in a way. But I suppose it's like all of the, you know, the pharmaceutical companies may make a living out of, mm. out of us as well. So it's like, I don't know, the whole, that whole thing's crazy. I, I if, you, if you were to sort of, if you, do you think if you were born in a different time mm. where the, tr the, the drawbacks of your condition, ADHD, and, and the, were, weren't such a hindrance mm. in the modern world that we live in, if you were born like 3,000 years ago when life was a lot more simpler, do you mm. think you would need medication or do you think you would find a, a, a lifestyle that suited your traits? Hmm, that's a good question. I wonder if, uh, we, would, we would just be um, slightly weird people, wouldn't we? That's what it would be, you know, and we'd probably just have to fit in. That's what's mm. happened up till now. Do you think you would be the hunter? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's one of my super skills is that I have no um, qualms to, you know, when everybody else is scared of a situation, I'm the first one up front on that. Mm. You know, I've been in positions where people have been having fights and I'm like right in there holding two like six foot six men apart because I don't have that fear. It's really weird. That's a very true point. I think that that's mm. what we probably were built for. I think I think that there is a reason why people are, are uh, neurodivergent and it's working out, you know, some people are great with numbers and that's why their, you know, their brains work that way. Some people are great with facts and figures and that's why the brain, you know, and mm. it, the, our neurodivergence is there for a reason. Mm. It's not just a default. We're here for, because there's something that, uh, you know, we, we were put in into our um, tribal groups to mm. be able to achieve. Yeah, definitely. I think there's an evolutionary point to ADHD. You know, yeah. we'd, we'd be the, we'd be chopping down the trees. We'd be overlooking the camp staying up all night making sure everyone's safe yeah it's we'll be, we'll be <laughs> so <laughs> true well exhausting though still exhausting back then yeah. <laughs> i'm already tired maybe not analyzing the stars to yeah. work out but no <laughs> there's a section where we we i, I asked the community for a, a woe the washing machine of woes <laughs> Come um, on. and i'm gonna read out this week's woe right. and see if you see if you relate to it um <laughs> and we'll see what it says 
This one's quite funny, actually. ADHD should create a service where we swap our hobbies for a few weeks so we don't have to buy new stuff. <laughs> wow, that would be sad. I'd be really bored. <laughs> Do you? Are you a big shopper? Well, I'm better at it now. I used yeah. to like get a really big idea, like, okay, I'm going to be into puzzles or I'm going <laughs> to buy a new... or And I'd spend a lot of money on something and then lose interest in it. Yeah, sometimes never use it at all. Never unbox it. Yeah, same. Yeah. I'm like that. But... Yeah, I've, I've been to so many boot fairs. I bought um, the Walking Dead board game Did for you? like 15 quid and it's still got the plastic wrapping in oh, it. But, God. but if, I have, if we had this service, I could put it on there and swap it for someone else and then that 15 quid wouldn't go to waste. I got my nephew, the one who's autistic, because uh, we're both obsessed with sharks mm. and uh, I got him this George board game. And honestly, within about 10 minutes of opening it, we were like, this is too, too heavy. It's a board <laughs> game. We were like, I'm out. Um but like uh, now there's things that I want to do. So I have I have another problem where I'm second guessing whether I will or won't use the, them mm. now. So that I'm agree. I'm in a better place now. I know that it's a sort of manic shopping experience that I tend to be getting kicks from. But what I um, what I now do is like, I really want to start badminton. I've wanted to start badminton every year for the last 10 years. I walked into, I went to Lily White's yesterday. I was like, look at badminton rackets. And I was like, right, this is the one. And I was just standing there holding this racket going, but do I? Am I going to use this? And then I put it back. Even though I really want to start badminton, I really want to start. But I just can't. <laughs> I can't. I can't commit to it now because I feel like, oh, I'm probably not going to do this. Mm. But I've got to do it. I want to do it. So it's stopping me doing the things I want to do. Mm. So it's gone from one way to the other. So yeah, do you think you've been a victim of the ADHD tax? Is that, what is the ADHD tax? I never it's quite know. It's where you forget to pay parking tickets so they double where you oh my god I've, all my businesses are fucked up because I, of this <laughs> exact reason like I make enormous mistakes but I, I had to bail out my business and I took a loan out against my home and then didn't even realise even though my accountant should have probably helped me here but like I didn't even realise that I in taking out this loan mm. I ended up getting like a huge tax bill for both on, on my personal tax and then on my corporation tax to the point where it actually killed my businesses you know, and it killed, it like made me have to, you know, I'm now mm. in an enormous, like obscene amount of debt. So yeah, like it's really, really fucked me over. So not even in a little way, but in a major way, like I never pay bills. I mm. live there, unless I had an assistant, you know, the one thing I do have, which is a brilliant thing, but I haven't been able to afford it because I fucked my businesses up <laughs> in the last 18 months, because I had an assistant who was the best thing ever. And she was my, like we doubled with each other mm. and she got shit done that I couldn't do. And that was a huge privilege, you know, because yeah. like I said, I've had no money in the last few years. So, but that was why I was able to achieve because mm. I had somebody going, right, these are the things you're sitting down. I'm holding you down mm. until you sign this contract or until you pay this bill. Yeah. It's good. It's almost like a body double. So it's body like, double. Yeah. Exactly. One, one who is not neurodivergent. Yeah. He makes you do all the non neurodivergent stuff. But I don't have that anymore. And that's hard. It really does make a difference. Mm. What's, the, what's the most impulsive thing you've ever done? Oh God, so many things. Where I wouldn't even know where to start with that. Pro probably spent uh, a good amount of money going to, to a business I didn't really want to go into. And I uh, think yeah. deep down, I probably knew that. And I was just like, oh fuck it, I'm going in. <laughs> <laughs> if you could describe living with ADHD, what would you say? It's a roller coaster, isn't it? It's an absolute ride. Um, but it's a wild ride, but it's it's something that we, we you know, we spent a lot of time talking about the, the mad side of it. But the good side of it is, you know, I have a very fulfilled life, you know, it's never boring. I, you know, I'm constantly wanting to educate myself. I'm constantly wanting to move forward. You know, I have focus, you know, I have, I have focus in places where I, when I really want it, I don't in other bits, you know, I, I, I'm very, the more I could get to control it, the more satisfied I am with, mm. with my life. And I think a lot of people have very unsatisfactory lives. So I'm very, very pleased with myself for that. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Gizzy, thank you so much thank for today. You. Thank that you. That was fun. See, I wasn't that mean, was I? <laughs> no, you were actually. <laughs> yeah. No, you were perfect. Thanks, Gizzy, thank so much. You. Cheers.